dear brothers and sisters, you know, in this world, we travel. We might uh, go from one place to another. Like most of us are in Chicago now, many of you would have traveled to many different parts of the world. We take journeys and we have experiences on those journeys. Many times people take vacations and they go on vacations to uh, quote unquote areas where the climates they think are better, where the sceneries are better, which are uh, uh, places which um, are going to relax them. And they go on the journey and they have experiences. But the journey that the great saints take us on is a journey far, far different than any other physical journey that we might take. This is a journey which unfolds our real self. This is a journey which makes us experience that which cannot be perceived through our senses. Our physical senses are always having perceptions of what they are experiencing. And those are all perceptions which we take to be reality. And so whatever we see through these eyes, whatever we hear through these ears, and whatever we experience through our other physical senses, we take them to be real. But they are just perceptions of the materialistic or the matter which is all around in this physical region. For the saints and mystics and the great spiritual masters, they take us on a spiritual journey. A journey which is making us connect with the primal manifestations of the divine. A journey which is going to culminate in the merger of a soul in God. Since this journey is a spiritual journey, since this journey is a journey on the divine light and sound of God, along the way, we experience love like we've never experienced before. We see beauty like we've never seen before. You know, we look in the sky and whether it's a sunrise or a sunset or a cloudy day, and you look up there and the sky looks beautiful. And every day looks different. But what we experience within is thousands of times more beautiful than what we experience through these physical senses. And as we go on the spiritual journey, as Sandarshan Singh Ji Maharaj explains through one of his verses, it's a journey of love, it's a journey of light. He says in one of his verses, he says, Khaak se taba ke kasha humne to jab kiya safar ish mila kadam kadam hus mila nazar nazar. So he's saying, when I traveled from the earth, earthy to the heaven, heavenlies, I found love at every step and beauty in every glance. So the journey within is a journey in which we experience love, divine love, love of God, love which has no parallels in this world. You know, the greatest love that we talk about in this world is the love of a mother for the child. For the love of God is many, many, many times more. A mother loves the child tremendously because to the mother, the child is a part of the mother. And so a mother would go through all kinds of difficulties to make sure that the life of the child is protected, is, is uh, trouble-free, is in a state in which the child 
is happy at all times. Children many times don't recognize the sacrifices of the mother. There's a very uh, interesting humorous example, which if you remember, will always make you understand how much a mother does for each and every one of us. So there was a mother who was a working mother. And one morning, as she got up, she got to the kitchen to uh, have breakfast before going out of work. And so as she got to the kitchen and, you know, there's a dinner table in the dinner area. And right on the chair where she, she sits, it's very uh, common in most households, you know, the chair for the dad is fixed, the chair for the mom is fixed, the chair for the children is fixed, because you don't want to keep on changing chairs every day. So you sit at the same places. So in the place where she was sit, uh, there was a sheet of paper. It looked like uh, on which in handwriting looked like a bill had been written on it. So she picked it up and she realized this was the handwriting of her younger son. And the son had written, this is a bill for mom. Picking up garbage, one dollar. <laughs> Mowing the lawn, five dollars. Picking up groceries, at the store, ten dollars. Total bill, one plus five plus ten, sixteen dollars. Mom owes me sixteen dollars. He left her there. She looked at it, she thought to herself, she smiled, took the paper, went to work. The next morning, when the child comes for the breakfast, there's a sheet of paper in front of the chair with the child sits. It says, bill from mom to son. <laughs> Keeping you in my stomach for nine months. <laughs> Price, nothing. Providing you with milk. When you were growing, price, nothing. Buying you clothes, whenever we needed them, price, nothing. Getting all the food for you so you could get stronger, price, nothing. Total, nothing. Son, you don't owe me anything. So mother gives selflessly. She gives because she loves the child. Many times, parents, mothers and fathers too, but the fathers are the ones who are providing for the family, they do those activities which might be difficult for them so that the children could lead life better than they live themselves. They might cut down on certain things for themselves and make sure that the children have them. And sometimes in the back of the parents there might be this feeling that maybe once we get old, Maybe if uh, illness or sickness comes to us, when it's very difficult for us to move, maybe at that time, our children will help us. And they might be, some parents might do it for that too. We are living in societies which have changed. You know, there used to be times when families would live together and when parents would get older, they would live with the children and they'll take care of them. Today things are much different. And so sometimes the parent might have this feeling that uh, our children would take care of us and help them. But when we think about God's love for us 
and the help that we get from God through the conduit of the spiritual masters of the saints and the mystics, we find that they have no expectations of anything to be rewarded back to them for the help that they provide to us. It is very interesting um, when we go into history and when we read the writings of the great saints and mystics and when we uh, try to find out about their life. You know, why are they doing this? When we look at the life of uh, the three great spiritual masters of the last century, Hazur Baba Savan Singh Ji Maharaj, Paramsan Kripal Singh Ji Maharaj, and the Alpurus and Darshan Singh Ji Maharaj, we find that they were giving and giving and giving. Giving to everyone who came to them, not only their family members, not only their relatives, not only their friends, but anyone who came to them. Whether we had physical needs, whether we had mental needs, emotional needs, spiritual needs, Whatever difficulties we had, they always extended a helping hand to us. They were helping us so that we could lead lives which would be peaceful, in which the direction of our life would be guided towards God. They were not expecting any returns from us. Even if we said thanks to them, they would always say, that these thanks should go to my own spiritual master. They will never claim that they're doing anything. But as we look back at history, we start to get a glimpse of who they were and why were they helping us so much selflessly. Sandarshan Singh Ji Maharaj has written one of his verses. He says, Lord, I am yar ke dar se, vaks ne, jab hume pukara hai. So he's saying, when we would translate it, um, a loose translation would be that I was with my eternal beloved, with God. I was in the company of God. I was sitting with God. I was playing with God. I was. Um, Having the darshan of God, I was with God. And then there were demands of the time. People down on earth were getting away from knowing God. Their attention was getting more and more um, pulled into the world. And those were the times when God felt that the attention of the people had to be redirected back to God. And because of the needs of the time, I was sent back. Not that I wasn't enjoying that, I was in bliss. When you're with God, you can't be in any better place. I was having the time of my life. But since there were needs here, I was sent back here, and this is what we see in the lives of all great saints and mystics. When they're here, they're not living for themselves, they're living for each and every one of us. They're trying to help us in whatever manner help can come to us. And we see the little children will go to these great saints and ask, should I study this, should I study that, should I do this, should I do that, should I take this job, should I take that job, should I go into this profession? or that profession, all kinds of uh, directions they were giving to everyone. And, and, and this was not limited to a few. These were just mundane directions. They were also helping people spiritually to teach them how to experience themselves at a much higher conscious level. 
how to rise above physical body consciousness and be able to go on a journey of love or journey of light. And not only would they teach a method of experiencing the realities of our existence in a connection with God, the guidance are not like it is of the teachers here at school or college where they teach you a subject and then you're on your own. But through the process of initiation, through the process of making a connection with the divine light and sound of God, which is within each and every one of us, this creative power, which is within each and every one of us, they also then stayed with us. They stayed here at the seat of our soul. So that any time we needed guidance, 24 hours a day, year after year after year, they would be there. It's not like, you know, our teacher is someplace else, we are someplace else, we don't know how to get guidance. That their availability to us was there for all times, as if they're waiting for us to invert, to go within, so they could guide us. And we could be trying to go within at any time, sometimes in the morning, sometimes in the afternoon, sometimes in the evening. And you can well imagine if someone is waiting for you and you show up after many, many, many hours or days or months or weeks or years, how difficult it is. But they always meet us with a smile. They're always happy to see us. They're happy to guide us because they know that if their guidance can help us take steps towards our goal, then the life on this earth will get better. Times will get better. They know that the more we Inward, the more we go within, the more we meditate, the calmer we will be, the more peaceful we will be. They know that as peace is imbibed by us within ourselves, as we experience the peace within ourselves, this peace is going to come out of us. And it's going to help everyone else. Our dealings with everyone else will get non-violent. Love as we partake of the reservoir within ourselves is going to ooze out of us. And that love is going to help everyone else that we come in touch with. So they realize that the whole environment will get better as we get peaceful ourselves, as we go on the spiritual journey, as we experience the divine light and sound of God, as we get closer and closer to God. And so they are very, very happy when that happens. That's their sole purpose of coming here. They're not looking for anything from us because they have completed their journey. They're one with the Creator. They don't need anything from here. It's like if you own everything, you don't need anything more. God, the Creator, has created everything. So everything is God's. They, being with God, have everything. And so they have no need for anything from any one of us. And their love is selfless. And that's the goal of selfless service. The reason that saints and mystics are sent to this world is to help the people who are living in those times know the realities of their existence. Otherwise, most people live at the level of their physical senses and think that that is all there is. And so through the help and grace, of the great saints and mystics, we are able to experience 
life as it truly is. The help that is provided to us to experience that we're not the body, we're not the mind, we're not our emotions, that in reality we are soul. The help that comes to us so that while being in this physical body, we are able to experience our soul. We don't have to wait till death to know what life and death is all about. While being alive in this physical body, we can experience what death is all about. Many people are afraid of death because we see our loved ones pass away and we never physically get to meet them again. Based on our traditions, their bodies are put back into matter. And most people don't know what happens at the time of death and after death. But through the grace of the great saints and mystics, we can rise above physical body consciousness. We can experience the transition that happens when the soul leaves the body. And as we experience that transition, then we are able to lead a life in which there is no more fear of death. Death brings many, many fears to many, many people. But once we are able to rise above physical body consciousness, when we are able to experience the joys of the spiritual regions, once we are able to experience light, which clarifies everything, so that our vision is clear, then we find peace within ourselves. And the beauty of the experience of being with the divine light and sound of God is that as we have that experience ourselves, the realization starts to set into us that we are all extensions of the Creator. You know, as we live at the level of our physical senses, we all think we're different than everyone else. You know, we look in the mirror, our face is different than anyone else. The language we speak could be different, the way we dress up could be different, our faiths could be different, our cultures could be different. So we think of ourselves as being different. And whenever you think yourself as different than someone else, then there's this ego that builds in to try to make us feel, oh, I have to be better than everyone else. And that is a downfall. But as soon as we experience the divine light and sound within ourselves, automatically the realization sets in that we are all one and the same. And then our dealings with other are peaceful. Then we are not jealous of anyone else. We know that we are all one and the same. It's just an extension of the Creator. Then, as we pass through life, we are caring, we are helping others. We know that if God has given us some means, whether they be financial, whether they be physical, whether they be emotional stability, or mental astuteness, that these are gifts of the Creator, and we need to use them to help everyone else so that their life gets better. And then there's calm, and then there's peace, and there's love and joy all around us. And it all starts with the grace of God. It's God's grace that we have this human birth. It's a gift from God. Otherwise, our soul could be transmigrating in 8.4 million of species. 
It's also a gift of God that in our lives, the roles of the spiritual masters come in. That's God's gift. There are billions of people who live in the world, but only a few whose lives turn towards God through the grace of the spiritual masters. That's another gift of God. And then it's a gift from the spiritual masters who initiate us, who uh, have our attention, which is focused on the world also, we focus within ourselves, who turn us from the world towards God and who then connect us with the creative power, with the divine light and sound of God, so that we are uplifted from the physical region to the spiritual regions. And, and it's a gift of the spiritual masters that guidance is provided to us till our soul merges in God. Hazur Baba Savan Singh Ji Maharaj would often say that once we have been initiated to the grace of a perfect spiritual master, we will definitely find the merger of a soul and God. It's a question of how focused we are to get to our goals. And Sant Kripal Singh Ji Maharaj clarified it even further. And he said that the maximum it can take is four lifetimes. But many, many, many of us can reach there in one lifetime. If we lead ethical lives, if we put in the prescribed time towards our spiritual practices, towards meditation, if we have a passion to reach our goal. But even if we don't do those things, then we will not go on the wheel of transmigration. We will still get another human birth. Let us get back to the Creator in this very lifetime. There's no fun coming back again and again and again. Because all we do is, you know, we're passing through some of the old karma, we're building some new karma, and we just keep on, you know, it's just like you write something and you wash it away, and you write something and you wash it away, you write something, wash it away. You never get a painting done, or a writing done, or anything else done. So we need to be able to get to our goals, and we can all reach our goals in this very lifetime. This is very clearly stated by all the great spiritual masters. It all boils down to our dedication to reach our goal. And this is why patience and perseverance has been talked about by the great spiritual masters. We should have patience. It should not be that we sit down and we say, oh, I didn't see the light, or I was not on the third plane today and then say, oh, you know, I'm not going to do anything. As we dedicate ourselves to reach our goal, as we give importance to knowing God, as we focus on the most important goal of our existence, which is to know ourselves and to have our soul merge in God, then if we will give it priority. And once we give it priority, we'll find the time for our spiritual practices. We will try to be better human beings. We will be loving, we'll be caring, we'll be truthful, we'll be non-violent, we'll be humble. Uh, all of these ethical virtues we'll try to inculcate. And as that happens, then we will definitely, definitely reach our goal. So let us meditate for a few minutes because there's nothing better than meditation. There's a spiritual practice that takes us on the journey of light and love. Uh, please sit as comfortably as you can. Close your eyes very gently, just like you close them when you go to sleep. Your eyeball should be straight, focus eight or ten inches in front of you. 
And as you close your eyes, those of you who've been initiated in the message of the beyond, uh, please do your simran. Those of you who are new here, please repeat any name of God that you feel comfortable with. This repetition of God's name should be done mentally and not out loud. Right in front of you, light will sprout forth. It could be flashes of light, circles of light, lights of various colors. Just keep your gaze in the middle of your experience. You'll be experiencing with time that the lights to you look like they're stabilized. What actually is happening is that the light of God is within yourself. It's not coming from the outside. In the beginning, we're not concentrated enough, so we, to us it looks like we see the light, we don't see the light, we see the light, we don't see the light. It looks like there are flashes of light. Actually, the light is always there. With time, as our concentration gets better, we experience the light all the time. They look like they stabilize. And then there are many other vistas that we experience. Sky, sky full of stars, and a moon, and a sun, and many, many other vistas open up for us. So just be focused in the middle of your experience, and whatever is right for you is what is going to be experienced by you. I uh, pray to God Almighty and to the three great spiritual masters of the past century, Hazur Baba Savan Singh Ji Maharaj, Paran Sankar Singh Ji Maharaj, and the Alpur Sandarshan Singh Ji Maharaj, to help each and every one of us connect with the divine power within and to experience the divine light in its effulgence. We'll be sitting for a few minutes. I'll be getting you out of this meditative state at that time. And my best wishes are with each and every one of you.
छोड़ दीजिए जी प्लीज लिव ऑफ